Well, why don't you open your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 1 to 12. Uh, You can find that on page 873 of the Bibles under the chair in front of you, or you can open the Bibles you've brought with you and uh, find Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus had finished this instruction, he departed from Galilee and went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away? He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. And I tell you, Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. But he told them, Not everyone can accept this saying, but only those it has been given to. For there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who are made by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves that way because of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, You've got a sermon outline there in your newsletters, uh, left-hand side, and uh, top right, some household questions. Uh, Given the nature of the passage, why don't I pray? And then we'll look at it together. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is the revelation of your nature. Thank you that your word is not just spoken and written, but incarnate. Thank you that the incarnate word speaks to us here. Father, uh, this is a passage that has caused debate. It is a passage that has caused argument. It is a passage that has been misused. We pray that this morning having heard last week about the hallmark of your kingdom being forgiveness, that you'll help us to hear Jesus clearly, speak about Jesus wisely, and communicate what Jesus says kindly. In his name we pray. Amen. When Jesus had finished this instruction, he departed from Galilee and went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Uh, One of my great failings at Bible college is that I didn't really pay much attention to geography. Uh, One of the great parts of the biographies of Jesus is the way in which they allow us to track where Jesus is, kind of like an early GPS. And at this point, we actually see Jesus continue on his journey to Jerusalem. Uh, Families, it's not a bad idea to get a map of Israel at this time and to be tracking where Jesus is going to just have it there as we continue to work through Matthew. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and we know what's going to happen there, don't we? And we've just remembered it. Jesus has been very clear about it. There, the Son of God, God's promised saviour and ruler of the world, will be rejected, he'll suffer, and he'll die. There, Jesus is going to be crowned king. In an upside-down kingdom, that causes immense confusion, but a kingdom where the sins of his people are forgiven. There at a moment where he is restless and in pain and suffering, he'll give rest for the weary, he'll bind up the broken, and he'll heal those who are sick with sin. Just a little before this, in Matthew chapter 17, as we heard the kids remind us, Jesus has been revealed in his magnificence, hasn't he? Up there on that mountain, and God has said, that's my boy, that's my boy. I love him, I'm well pleased with him. Do you notice what God said at the end? Listen to him. Jesus has just finished talking to his mob about life in the kingdom. 
Remember we looked at that over the last couple of weeks? What's life like in the kingdom of heaven? Well, life's dependent, as Phil Firth helped us think through. Life treats sin and stumbling blocks seriously in this kingdom. Life in the kingdom pursues the wandering sheep, confronts the wayward sheep, and last week we were reminded that life in the kingdom of heaven is the life of abundant forgiveness. And did you notice there in verses 1 and 2 as the crowds rush around him, Jesus keeps on the job. Do you notice what he's doing with the crowds? He's healing them. He heals the people who crowd around him. There are some in the crowd, though, who are not seeking healing. There are some in the crowd who are seeking hurt. Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? I'm at point two. Since Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, the Pharisees have been very clear. Literally, they want to wipe Jesus from the pages of history. They want to destroy him. They're not here because they've got an interest in the question. They're not here because they're wondering whether Jesus is kosher or not. They're here because they want to trap him. And so they actually pick a point of contention that in our world is often rife with danger, isn't it? They pick the issue of marriage and the way in which it breaks down. There are fewer more intimate and explosive arenas for debate than marriage. Marriage is the crucible where humans confront sin intimately, don't they? Where you bring two sinners together to live for the rest of their lives and you'll always get a living example of sin and forgiveness, won't you? And conflict at its most intense So I don't think it's a mistake that Matthew has chosen to relay this issue here just as we've heard about forgiveness. Uh, Matthew could have chosen any number of incidents, I suspect, on the road to Jerusalem, couldn't he? I don't think this is the only time the Pharisees tested Jesus, but Matthew's chosen this incident. I think that's important too. In today's world, oh, we're really across history because I suspect that opposition to God and his design for the world, alternative kingdoms, I think that opposition is most often clearly displayed in how the world treats marriage, how the world understands it, how it applies it across a broad area of life. I opened The Australian yesterday, and in the Enquirer section, I don't think there's any irony intended, You have over here what to know about divorce before walking down the aisle because the assumption is your marriage is going to fail. The first bit of advice, get your prenup sorted because you're inevitably going to fail and we want to keep you out of the courts. So you move from a publication like that to your television and you watch Married at First Sight, which reduces marriage to entertainment and ratings fodder, where we laugh at the discomfort of others in the public. You go from that to Love Island, which then makes sexual immorality a thing to binge on as we watch people made in the image of God prance around. Even in our wider society, the definition of marriage is now open to a public vote, isn't it? It's not a standard. It's not near into creation. But it's a matter for a referendum and some opinion polls. It shouldn't surprise us that the religious leaders choose marriage to trip Jesus. And the question they ask is the legality of divorce in God's world. These men know their Bible, or at least they're paid to know their Bibles, aren't they? And so they talk to Jesus based on Deuteronomy chapter 24, part of a sermon that Moses preached before God's people went into the promised land, into the signpost to the kingdom of heaven. 
If a man marries a woman but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something improper about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her and send her away from his house. The debate, it's around that word improper, displeasing. Uh, On the one hand, there was a theological school that had a really strict reading of that and said that it meant any incident of sexual immorality, an affair, sexual infidelity. On the other hand, there was a more dominant view in Jesus' day that was slightly more relaxed, that argued that improper could cover anything from, wow, the looks are gone, through to the cooking on the dinner table. So the question aims to trap Jesus. It's a wedge. It's deliberately expansive. Do you notice how they ask it? On any grounds? That sounds remarkably like that snake in the garden. You can't touch any tree? Now, if he sides with the stricter approach, then Jesus is obviously out of touch with current society, isn't he? Does that sound familiar? If he sides with the more liberal approach, the more relaxed approach, then Jesus can be accused of not taking God's word seriously and not treating marriage in a high enough way. The aim is to trap him. Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And he also said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Gee, he's wise, isn't he? Gee, he's wise and gentle. Do you know your Bibles, fellas? I mean, you'd expect them to. They're experts in the Bible, aren't they, these men? Well, they're experts, but they're not proponents, aren't they? They're readers but they're not listeners. Don't you know God's design? Where does Jesus go? He goes to the first two chapters of the whole Bible. He goes to God's revelation in his creation, back to Genesis 1 and 2. This is pre-fall. So none of this stuff is part of the original design this divorce and breaking up. And sex and gender and marriage are all knit into creation. They're not produced by the fall. God made man and woman. God made male and female in his image. There, that's a remarkably confronting statement, isn't it? Because these men are only asking a question from the perspective of men. And Jesus said, hold on, gentlemen. Women are made in the image of God, man and woman. And they're joined in union. It's a union that reflects the nature of God in community. Do you notice the for this reason there in verse 5? Because God made them man and woman, marriage is the result. A man and a woman come together, one woman, one man, They leave, they cleave in a lifelong union. Do you see it's one flesh? Do you notice how that's repeated a number of times? And when they come together in the image of God, each image bearer joined to the other reflects the image of God as best we can. Two different people living in community for the rest of their lives. It's meant to reflect the nature of God who's three in one. And here we have two in one. And God's design, it's not for separation, is it? Do you notice that? One flesh, one flesh, one flesh. How high a view of marriage does Jesus have? It's pretty high, isn't it? It's a delight. God made man and woman in his image, so that they could be joined, one woman, one man, in lifelong union, creating one flesh, not to be torn apart. That union is not 
anything that's to be discarded, but a very reflection of the nature of God, the image of God, individual in communion. Don't break it. He's answered the question, hasn't he? He's answered the question. There is no reason in God's creative and creation design for divorce. I love election campaigns. I know that makes me a little different. But one of the things I love about election campaigns is how often the media thinks it's filmed a gotcha moment. Do you remember those gotcha moments where some journalists ask some obscure question about obscure policy and then the media films and they, oh, we got him in a contradiction. This is a gotcha moment for the religious leaders. I'm at point four on the island because look how quickly they jump in verse seven. Gotcha. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away? Notice the perspective. They've got him. If there were cameras in those days or mobile phones, it'd be everywhere, wouldn't it? Gotcha. Jesus has just stated very clearly that God's design is for marriage not to break. Uh, hang on, Jesus, do you know your Bible? Why did Moses command us to give divorce papers and send her away? Oh, why would God create one thing and then command another? What are you going to say about that, Jesus? Which is it? I think it's worth pausing at this point and remembering something about how Matthew writes. Remember, I've talked about it a number of times. At very rare moments, Matthew suddenly stops talking about events in the past and starts talking about events in the present. Remember that happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? It's suddenly you're walking with the disciples up to the hill. Well, Matthew does it here again. In verse 7, verse 8 and verse 10, he suddenly goes into the present tense. And suddenly we as the readers are transported there to that discussion. I don't think Matthew's making a mistake here. I think Matthew's actually saying to us as readers, hey, do you know your own tendency to be a Pharisee? We can be just like them, can't we? We can play games with God's word. Oh, how can Jesus say that there when God says that there? We're not trying to trap Jesus, but we're certainly trying to trip him. Because if we trip him, we can then choose which one we want to obey. I think it's no mistake that Matthew at particular points here suddenly goes to the present tense so that he can say to us, what do you do with that command about listening to Jesus? How do you handle the word of God? Because God's nature isn't that inconsistent, is it? God's nature is remarkably consistent and so we should expect his word to be the same, especially as Jesus teaches us. Jesus immediately goes on the offensive. I'm at point five on the outline. Look there in verse eight. He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. It's not like that from the beginning. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Remember the passage they were using, Deuteronomy 24? Remember how I read that for you? Let, let, me, let me just read Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 for you again, and listen to the command. If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something improper about her, he may write her a divorce certificate hand it to her and send her away from his house. How often do we give commands with ifs and mays? There's no command there, is there? It's a concession. It's a permission. And do you notice why God allows this? Did you hear it there in what Jesus said? Because of what? The hardness of your hearts. God knows our brokenness, doesn't he? God knows our hearts are set against him. God knows that those who bear his image actually don't want to just bear the image, they want to be the image. They want to be God. 
And so we take this marvellous thing that God has created and we actually break it. And as we break it, we break each other, don't we? And we damage and we hurt and we cause pain. And God in his mercy has given a concession, a permission. And notice that Jesus says it was not like this from the beginning. God didn't break it. God didn't create it broken. God has provided a concession because our hearts are hard. That's a pretty confronting statement, isn't it? It's very confronting, especially in our world today. Jesus holds marriage in such high regard and he discusses it quite openly and clearly. And then he goes a little further. Did you see it there in verse 9? And I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Jesus is conceding in his kindness the possibility of divorce and remarriage in one case, and that's the case of sexual immorality. Now, now before I go any further, let me just make a couple of clarifying comments. Jesus isn't reworking God's design, is he? Notice that he's not made any comment about its problem. He's describing a concession because of our hearts, a permission that comes out of the nature of God's heart. Notice, too, that this has come after such an important passage where Jesus has said very clearly, what do we do with sin? We confront it to restore, don't we? In repentance, that's the hallmark of the kingdom of heaven. And notice very carefully that Jesus has created a possibility here, not a command. Jesus has done exactly what God did back in Deuteronomy 24. Marriage is something to be treasured, something to be persevered, something to be worked on and upheld. Why? Because the joining of a man and a woman in lifelong union reflects the nature of God. Marriage is not a contract to negotiate and exit from. Marriage is not a form of entertainment that we need to binge on. Marriage is not a plaything for the opinion of the masses. Marriage is the creation of God to reflect his nature every day. If the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. You can see the disciples, can't you? They've just listened to this and it's still in the present tense, so maybe Matthew's wondering whether we might think this. It's almost as if they throw their hands in the air and go, Jesus, you've gone too far. You always teach stuff, tough stuff, but this is just too tough. We may as well just choose the... the, the what option? We'll get to the bottom of the barrel. We'll go with being single. They've just given up, haven't they? If that's what marriage is like, well, what's our other option? It's to be single. I want us to notice something very clearly about these men. They're very clearly saying, Jesus, it's too tough, this teaching. And then they're also making a comment about all those who aren't married. It's a second-rate option to be single. And Jesus actually confronts them on that, doesn't he? He actually has as high a view of singleness as he does of marriage. Look what he says there in verse 11. But he told them, not everyone can accept this saying, but only those it has been given to. For there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who are made by men. There are eunuchs who have made themselves that way because of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. The hard saying that not anyone can accept? Well, it's what the disciples have just said about singleness. Not everyone can accept your view on singleness, so let me just educate you on my view of singleness. Jesus takes an example from their lives, a eunuch, and then he describes three possibilities. Some are eunuchs by birth. 
Some are eunuchs by the violence of others. And some have actually made a decision to be single. Uh, The word eunuch is used there to talk about a single person. And and Jesus is saying very clearly on, on each of those levels, God has given this. God doesn't give broken things. God gives good things. And whether it's by the brokenness of the world or the brokenness of relationship or the choice of someone, in each of the instances, Jesus is saying singleness is good. In fact, some people choose singleness because of the kingdom of heaven we're talking about. It's not a second-rate option. It's not a bottom-of-the-barrel choice. It's given by God, and it's good. Jesus is healing, point eight on the outline. Others come to hurt. The religious leaders ask a question that exposes so many scabs. It backfires because Jesus answers their questions from the word of God. He exposes their hollowness and he has a high view of both marriage and singleness, a view that we are to listen to. Uh, Let me close with just... Six, it's not going to take long, very simple observations. God and Jesus have a high view of marriage. It is good. Marriage reflects the nature of God. Two into one. Lifelong between one man and one woman. God knit it into creation. Do we have such a high view of marriage? Second, God and Jesus have a high view of singleness. It's good too. It's not a second best option. It's not a pit stop on the way to getting married. Whether it's by nature, the hands of others or by choice, it is something given. Do we have such a high view of singleness and single people? Thirdly, the pain of sin is obvious, isn't it? It's striking in this part of Matthew how he paints a vision of sin that is horribly painful. It breaks life and creation. Do we have a regard of sin like that? Fourth, the pain of sin is met by the mercy of God. Do you notice that when humans break God's creation, God doesn't spit his dummy? He doesn't take his ball and he goes home. God actually bends to concede and permit so that more hurt isn't created. Do you notice that? God's mercy meets the pain of sin. Fifth, the confronting truth of divorce. Do you notice that the first disciples were confronted by divorce? Do you notice that they found the teaching tough? And then... They went from that to other areas. Divorce breaks. It causes great sorrow and mourning. And we need to recognize this. Are we confronted in the same way by these words? Finally, the hallmark of forgiveness. Can I be very clear? No sin except the rejection of Jesus, is unforgivable. Jesus has just talked to us about that, hasn't he? That we confront sin to restore through repentance and forgiveness. In the kingdom of heaven, any sin can be forgiven, especially in the pain that we experience. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It is tough. Uh, It's your word from creation. And we give you thanks for the way in which Jesus teaches it gently, kindly, and simply. Father, thank you for your mercy in the face of our hardness of heart. Father, thank you for your high view of marriage and singleness. Father, thank you for your abundant forgiveness. Help us to be a community that follows in the footsteps of Jesus in these ways. In his name we pray. Amen. Any questions? (laughs) 
Yes, Tim. Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. Um, so for those at home who might have heard it, given the fact that Jesus, and quote Tim, this isn't my line, the most eligible bachelor in Galilee, uh, perhaps he's pointing out his own situation there as he talks about choosing to be single for the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a perfectly obvious conclusion. I think Tim's picked up something. And again, this is one of the things, things end up on the cutting room floor. Um, that is... It, the best bloke to go to for advice on marriage is who? It's a single bloke. Start any wedding sermon that way and people will listen to you at least for the next 30 seconds. Okay. But, but Tim's right. Look, Jesus has made that community. In fact, he's left the community of three in one, hasn't he, in order to come and deal with those who reject that community and bring them back. So, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff there that's worth thinking through and Jesus himself is a great, example of that. Don't go down the line of the liberals though, which I think, let me take it a bit further, they rework and say, of course Jesus had intimate relationships with women. He was surrounded by them. No, no, that, that's not what the Bible's saying. <laughs> so don't rework it so we want to make it in our, in our image. Yeah, Jesus was with Mary Magdalene, just go and read the Da Vinci Code. No, that's a load of rubbish. Uh, I think Tim's picked up a really important point there. Just look at Jesus and hear what he's saying to hear his story about singleness. Yeah, yeah. 